chapter three, part one is just, I'm going to reiterate what I said in class on today. This is cellular form and function. Um, so we're going to start off this chapter cells. There are many different types of cells. Cells are important uh, for your understanding and how the body works. Um, it's an important concept in physiology. And of course, it's the mechanisms um, forms the foundation or increases your understanding of mechanisms of disease and the rationale of therapy. So we're going to start talking about the different cell shapes, um, which is in the introduction of the, the chapter. Um, the cell theory, of course, psychology, of course, um, is the study of cells. Um, the cell theory states that all organisms are made up of one or more cells. Um, all cells are living um, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. There are about 200 types of cells in the human body with various shapes. Uh, one in particular, which is my favorite, is squamous. Squamous, um, the name simply means those cells are thin, flat, and scaly. The top layer of your skin, which is called the epidermis, um, is known as keratinized stratified squamous. So the top layer of our skin is made of keratin, which we're going to talk about in Chapter 6. Stratified means it has several layers. The epidermis has five layers. And squamous simply means um, it's very flat. Cuboidal, squarish looking. This one is found in your liver, your thyroid, your mammary glands. It's found in the bronchioles and it's also um, found in your kidneys. The columnar, columnar simply they're taller than um, than wide. Um, in your textbook, now you um, we can often find this one here in the tissue um, in the fallopian tubes of females or the the uterine tubes. And what it actually does. Uh, because of the, is there cilia on top, ciliated columnar, which actually will provide the, um, the movement or the sweeping motion to move the egg. Once the egg um, is uh, released from the ovary, it's going to move it, and it can actually move the embryo down to the uterus as well. So that is columnar. Um, in Chapter 5, On page 146, they're actually actually showing you the uh, simple columnar epithelium. Um, you have the microvilli, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and of course, you can see the goblet cells. The goblet cells are the ones that actually secrete mucus and other products. And the specific function, and it shows you where the representative location where you will find columnar cells in uterus and your uterine tubes, of course, you're going to find this particular one, this um, simple columnar epithelium. Polygonal, they're irregular shaped cells with multiple sides. I put the example of cheek cells because in Biology 103, we often, um, students often do an experiment where they have, will have to take a sample of their cheek cells, stain it, and observe it under the microscope, and they are irregularly shaped cells. Stellate is star-like. Your nerve cells uh, or the, um, the nerve fiber, of course, would fall under this category. Um, the little projections that you actually see coming off of the, um, the, the stellate cell in your textbook on page 77 are called dendrites. Spheroid to ovoid, they're round to oval, your egg cells and your white blood cells. Your discoid, which are disc-shaped disc cells, are your red blood cells. Fusiform, we're going to talk about this particular shape when we get to chapter 10, when we talk about the 160 muscles in chapter 10. Those are typically thick in the middle, which is the muscle belly, and they're tapered um, on both ends um, uh, with the tendons. So smooth muscles, skeletal muscles, you're um, going to find this shape in those particular muscles. Fiber simply means they're thread-like. You're going to find this one in um, skeletal muscles. They're made of fibers. And also the axon of a nerve cell or a neuron 
Um, another word for an axon, of course, is a nerve fiber, but you're going to find fibers when we get to chapter 12. The axon is has the shape of a fibrous thread like. Here are the shapes here. Plasma membrane is important. Uh, I'm just going to hit on this pretty quickly. Uh, if you look, the outer circumference, this double wall structure here around the cell is called your plasma membrane or cell membrane. The plasma membrane actually regulates what can enter and exit the cell. Um, inside of the cell, which is your intracellular fluid, you have what you call cytosol and you have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is a gel-like structure that's going to house all of your organelles. If you look to your left or to your right, you see all the names of the different organelles. Sitting right here in the center is your nucleus, which houses your DNA. You have your smooth ER, you've got your rough ER, you've got the mitochondrion, which is a powerhouse of the cell. Uh, you have the Golgi complex or the Golgi body. You've got um, Golgi vesicles here. Uh, you've got lysosomes, you've got um, the cytoskeleton, um, here's a fat droplet here inside of the cell. Um, so centrioles, which are involved in cell division and mitosis when you guys take anatomy, uh, I mean biology 103. And uh, of course, you have cytoskeleton that's going to give shape and structure to the cell, uh, which are typically your microtubules your intermediate filaments and your um, actin filaments. So the cytosol, the inside is called the intracellular fluid, the ICF, and of course the fluid outside of your cell is called the extracellular fluid. Extracellular fluid typically is going to bathe that particular cell um, such as cerebrospinal fluid, which actually your brain, our brain floats in this in the cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is around our, our spinal cord. Um, you also have lymphatic fluid that's produced in your lymphatic system. And of course you have blood um, plasma, which is um, uh, a part of the uh, fluid outside of the cells as well. So this is another name for it is interstitial fluid. Cholesterol, glycolipids, okay, cholesterol we know is a lipid from chapter 2. 20% uh, of the membrane lipids is going to actually be right there in the center of the phospholipid bilayer and it's going to stiffen the membrane. Glycolipids, on the other hand, they are short carbohydrate chains on extracellular face. Contributes to glycocalyx, carbohydrate coating on your cell surface. Now your glycolipids, which are actually on, um, I have no idea where they are, but glycolipids, they are, they're kind of, yeah, it's a carbohydrate and a lipid. If you look at all the membrane lipids, uh, or the proteins actually on page 81, I kind of hit on, just kind of vaguely talked about them. You have the different proteins that are um, correlating with the phospholipid bilayer. And one in particular is a glycolipid, which is a carbohydrate and a lipid. And of course, you have a glycoprotein, uh, which is just a carbohydrate attached to a protein. Okay, um, the thing with the glycolipid, I think I mentioned to you guys earlier, glycolipids, of course, um, they are responsible for our blood types. Glycolipids are typically found on the A, uh, B, a, B, and O, that which are your four main blood types. Um, so they have different carbohydrate chains on um, the cell surface of these blood groups, the ABO blood groups, that's what they're called. Um, so what they do is they also they kind of work in conjunction with your glycoproteins because they're involved in cell recognition. Um, and they protect the immune system as well. So if you look on page, gee whiz, page 84, it is chemically unique in everyone but identical twins, okay? Um, the identical twins, they're going to have the same, their glycolipids are going to be the same. I mean, they're identical twins, okay? It acts like an identification tag that enables the body 
to distinguish its own healthy cells from transplanted tissues, invading organisms and disease cells. Human blood types and transfusion compatibility are determined by glycolipids. So on, on the your blood type or your ABO blood group, you have these glycolipids. And of course, they differ from person to person, which is why when you get a blood transfusion, the glycolipid on the blood that you're getting from the other person has to be compatible um, to yours. Okay, uh, Tissue recognition when it comes to getting... Um, what do you call it? Um, a transplant, an organ transplant or something. The same thing goes for that as well. So a glycoprotein cell identity marker. Here's your glycoprotein over here. Okay. Act, acting as a cell identity marker, distinguishing the body's own cells from foreign cells. So as I said, now this one right here, the identification they're called identification tags. So when you have the glycocalyx, which is, you know, the sugary structure for both the glycolipids and your glycoproteins, they're capable of recognizing self from non-self, if that makes any sense to you. So what they do is when they recognize, for example, white blood cells, they're supposed to recognize each other in the immune system, you know. However, if something foreign which is non-self, gets into your immune system, your white blood cells are supposed to attack that foreign invader, whether it's a cancer cell, a virus, a bad bacteria, or what have we, okay? Because it, it antigens, those are foreign agents that get into the body, that's what they're called, and of course your antibodies will attack them. Uh, so your antibodies will not be attacking each other, they're going to attack what? something that's foreign or something that's not a part of them. So they're, they're called self-recognition proteins. Um, and your B and T, well, I'm not going to talk about your B and T cells when you guys take anatomy to or two, you'll probably talk about that. So those are important. Your textbooks to page um, 84, I mean, it's no big deal. Um, if you look, there's a messenger, we're going to say is epinephrine, for example, which is a chemical. Okay, so that first messenger, which is epinephrine, is going to bind to the receptor of that um, first um, messenger, okay, in the plasma membrane, and it's going to activate um, adenylate cyclase. I can't even see that word. Okay, it's going to activate that. Okay. And what that's going to do is going to stimulate the second messenger. It's going to produce large amounts of cyclic amp from ATP. Okay, uh, that's going to be your your second messenger. So, um, and of course, the cyclic protein is going to bind to alpha kinase. But anyway, the bottom line is when you have a a first messenger, uh, it's going to actually interact with the second messenger. Um, and carry out any necessary steps or activities inside of your cell. So the second messenger communicates within your cell receiving chemical messages, okay? Chemical messages from those chemicals or hormones or neurotransmitters that we're going to talk about a little bit later this semester. Enzymes are their biological, biological catalysts which are responsible for um, breaking down um, proteins and they're involved in the digestion of molecules. Some important uh, channel proteins, they allow sm small hydrophilic molecules to penetrate or pass through the channel. So hydrophilic, anything that's going to um, have a positive interaction with water or dissolving water is going to go through that channel protein and it's, and, and it's not going to have any problems going through. Um, there's some are always open and some are gated. I talked about earlier where you have the ligand gated channels. Ligand gated channels respond to chemical messengers. Um, chemical messengers, as stated earlier, second messengers communicate receive what the chemical messengers such as epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, okay, um, and all of these are responsible for um, 
um, sending signals throughout the cell. Okay, so the ligand gated ligand gated channels. Now there are certain elements that are going are going to be involved, such as sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. You also have these voltage gated channels that respond to charge changes. Voltage gated channels, for example, is a positive charge will go to a negative charge, or a negative charge will go to a positive charge. Now, when you have the voltage gated channel, it's just a change in voltage across the membrane. This is called an action potential. It's going to generate an action potential, actually. Um, so you have this electrical potential or electrical currency, and we're going to talk about there are two ions we're going to talk about that are voltage gated channels, which is sodium and potassium. Mechanically gated channels respond to physical stress on the cell. So for example, um, if your stomach is mechanically gated uh, when you put food in it and it stretches, also um, just a slight touch, uh, a very, very light touch or pressure um, that's placed on your skin is going to activate the receptors in your skin. And the reason you're going to respond to that particular touch or pressure on your skin is due to uh, those gated channels are going to open. So these right here are crucial to nerve and what? Muscle function. So when we talk about muscle contraction in chapter uh, 11, we're gonna, you're going to learn about your voltage gated channels, um, your mechanically gated channels. And in chapter 12, uh, we're going to talk about the um, nerve, how signals go from one neuron to the um, second neuron in your brain. Um, so those are all going to be involved in that discussion. So just to kind of give you the heads up on that. Okay. Cell identity markers, glycoproteins acting as identification tags. Important. Okay. You also have microvilli. Now microvilli is important. You actually find these um, in your, your small intestines. And what microvilli actually do is they increase the surface area in your small intestine or increases the cell surface area. And that way, when that surface area is going to be increased, it's going to increase absorption in your small intestines because that's the function of your small intestines is to increase absorption. On some absorptive cells, they're very dense and appear as a fringe brush border. Um, so if you look in your textbook on page 85, they're actually showing you what microvilli looks like. Um, they are also found and they move. Okay, you're going to have some movement involved here with your microvilli. So because you also have them microvilli, those little bumpy things that you feel on your tongue or your taste buds, those are microvilli. You also have them in your inner ear. And of course, you also have them. They are they serve as sensory uh, receptors as well, which is why uh, we have them in our inner ear and on our taste buds. OK, so they don't serve as absorptive functions over here, but they do in um, the small intestines. OK. You also have cilia. Cilia is also involved in movement. Um, they're kind of similar to microvilli. Now, cilia, modal cilia, you have non-modal modal cil modal cilia uh, found on the, um, the little hairs in your nose is considered cilia, well, sensory cells of your nose. Um, the modal cilia are actually found in your respiratory tract, and they actually provide the sweeping motion to move mucus. Um, any debris that you may uh, that may get into your respiratory system so it won't damage your lungs. The cilia is going to provide that sweeping motion to get it out. Um, you also have cilia in your fallopian or your uterine tubes, which is going to actually, as stated earlier, is going to move the, um, the egg uh, or the embryo. The ventricles of your brain, you have cilia. So they're pretty much they're in a lot of different organs uh, in throughout the body. So you're going to learn a lot about those as well. Um, cilia also plays a very, very important role in um, cystic fibrosis. 
please make sure you read page 87, clinical application on um, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is uh, due to um, a defective gene. It's called the CFTR gene. And what actually happens, um, that particular gene, because it's defective, it's not working properly. Um, that gene actually is supposed to control the movement of sodium chloride or saline in water. If you look at figure 3.12, you can actually see the saline layer. Um, and you can actually see, and right there, that saline layer, those little hair-like structures that you see is called cilia. Um, when babies or kids that have cystic fibrosis, um, of course, the, the saline layer or that saline is not being distributed properly. So therefore, it's, it's that saline is supposed to make the mucus a little bit less sticky or thick. So actually in uh, kids that have cystic fibrosis, um, the mucus is going to be very, very thick and uh, their sweat is going to be very, very salty. So when that mucus gets extremely thick, it's hard for them to um, digest their food. So they have to take enzymes to help with the digestion of their food. And when they have that buildup of mucus, they often have to get the chest thumps to help break up the mucus in the uh, uh, chest and it can your book states can lead to chronic infections and um, pulmonary collapse so like I say it's um, those chloride pumps are not functioning properly so saline is just salt that's all it is um, so you can read about that for sure and here it is chloride pumps pump chloride into the extracellular fluid sodium and water will follow. So when you have enough sodium and water, so that mucus is going to flow properly. When you lack that in somebody that has cystic fibrosis because the chloride pumps aren't functioning properly, that's when you're going to have a buildup of mucus. All right. Hereditary disease in which cells make chloride pumps but fail to install them in the, in the plasma membrane. Chloride pumps fail to create adequate saline layer. There it is right here on the cell surface so and you have this buildup of mucus okay you can't digest their nutrients um, there's a decrease in the absorption of oxygen it plus the, the mucus plus the pancreatic ducts and the respiratory tract and it can be fatal at the age of 30. Flagella of course is responsible for is that long tail that you see on the sperm that whip like structure um, that's going to actually allow the sperm to, to swim. Pseudopods, my favorite. Okay. Pseudopods continually changing extensions of the cell that vary in shape and size can be used for cellular locomotion, capturing foreign particles, capturing food, debris, you name it. You're going to have pseudopods. Now, if you look, this picture right here is on page 88 of your textbook, figure 3.13. This first one right here is called an amoeba. An amoeba is one of those little uh, protists or organisms that you find in fresh water. And if you look all the way, it looks like a glob. It has no shape to it. The amoeba doesn't. And look, these little arm-like projections that you see all around it, these are called pseudopods. And so what they actually do, those pseudopods allow them to crawl or move per se, move about. And it also allows them to, um, it's in a way, a way for them to um, capture their food as well. Now here, letter B, this is called a neutral C, neutral field, which is one of your white blood cells. And what this one is going to do, if you look at the pseudopods here, this is bacteria. So... In our immune system, the white blood cells with the pseudopods, when bad bacteria gets into our immune system, it's going to wrap the little arms around the bacteria and it's going to break it down and it's going to um, destroy it or engulf it because it sees it as being what? Foreign particle, glycoprotein, glycolipids, right? This one right here is called a macrophage, which is um, um, a white blood cell as well. 
Macrophages are called phagocytes. They're your big eaters. Now, as you can see, this one has a lot of little, um, what do you call these little things? Filaments. This one has a lot of little filaments. So with the filaments projecting from the body, you can see how it can actually trap or attract bacteria to it. And of course, and what this, this one right here does, this is a very important, um, macrophages are very important because they do a complete checkup of our, of our immune system all the time. So they reach out with their thin filamentous pseudopods to snare bacteria and cell debris and reel them in to be digested by the cell. Like little janitors, macrophages thereby keep our tissues cleaned up. So, like I stated, they do like a complete checkup of our immune system. Alright, so I'm going to end this one and then I'm going to start a new one because I want to talk about diffusion and osmosis together so you can really get a great understanding of that. Alright?